All right, welcome back, folks. Today, we're going to be reading chapters five and six of The Green Mile, part one, The Two Dead Girls by Stephen King. Just to recap, uh, what we heard, what we read in chapters three and four. In chapters three and four, we learned that um, Paul Eschcombe goes to the prison library to read up on the tri on the case of John Coffey and the circumstances surrounding him arriving on the Green Mile at Cold Mountain Prison. We learned that we read we read about uh, crap. Start over. Da -da -da -da. Okay. All right, folks, welcome back. Well, today we'll be, we will be reading chapters five and six of the Green Mile book one, The Two Dead Girls by Stephen King. Just to recap chapters three and four. In chapters three and four, we learn that Paul Eschcombe goes to the prison library at Cold Mountain to read up on the circumstances surrounding John Coffey's arrival at Cold Mountain Prison and on to E Block, otherwise known as the Green Mile. In his reading, he reads up on the case and circumstances surrounding John Coffey's arrest and imprisonment. We read about Klaus Dederick, who is a well-to-do farmer who lives with his wife, Marjorie, and three children, Howard, better known as Howie, and twin girls, Cora and Kathy. We learn that Howie discovers his sisters missing when he wakes up in the morning and sees a grisly scene where his sisters had fallen, had fallen asleep the night before. Howie and Klaus go in search of them, and as they mount their search, they come across several clues that give them give us all an idea of a unhappy and brutal ending for the twin girls. John Coffey is discovered cradling the bloody bodies of the twin girls by a posse led by Deputy Rob McGee. And upon his arrest, John Coffey is each once again a phrase that we will hear several times throughout the book and will have a very heavy meaning as we continue through the story. And it, it is that when he says, I couldn't help it, I tried to take it back, but it was too late. And in the end, we learned that it only took the jury 45 minutes to come back with a guilty verdict for John Coffey. So that's a recap of chapters three and four. And now on to chapter five of The Green Mile, book one, The Two Dead Girls. I think you know I didn't find all that out during one hot October afternoon in the soon to be defunct prison library for one set of old newspapers stacked in a pair of Pomona orange chip crates. But I learned enough to make it hard for me to sleep that night. My wife got up at two in the morning and found me sitting in the kitchen, drinking buttermilk and smoking home roll bulgur. She asked me what was wrong and I lied to her for one of the few times in the long course of our marriage. I said I'd had another run in with Percy Wetmore. I had, of course, but that wasn't the reason she found me sitting up late. I was usually able to leave Percy at the office. Well, forget that rotten apple and come on back to bed, she said. I've got something that'll help you sleep and you can have all you want. That sounds good, but I think we'd better not, I said. I've got a little something wrong with my waterworks and wouldn't want to pass it on to you. She raised an eyebrow. Waterworks, huh? She said. I guess you might have taken up with the wrong street corner girl the last time you were in Baton Rouge. I've never been to Baton Rouge and never so much as touched another uh, the street corner girl. And we both knew it. It's just a plain old urinary infection, I said. My mother used to say boys got them from taking a leak when the north wind was blowing. Your mother also said to stay in all day if she spilled the salt, my wife said. Dr. Sadler, no, sir, I said, raising my hand. He didn't want me to take sulfur. And I'll be thrown up in every corner of my office by the end of the week. It'll run its course, but in the meantime, I guess we best stay out of the playground. She gets my forehead right over my left eyebrow, which always gives me the prickles, as, as Janice well knew. Poor baby. As if that awful Percy Wetmore wasn't enough. Come to bed soon. I did, but before I did, I stepped out onto the block, onto the back porch to empty out and check the wind direction with a wet thumb before I did. What our parents tell us when we were small seldom gets ignored, 
no matter how foolish it may be. Peeing outdoors is one joy of country living the poets never quite got around to. But it was no joy that night. The water coming out of me burned like a line of hot, like hot old coal, hot, hot coal oil. Yet, I thought it had been a little worse that afternoon and knew it had been worse two or three days before. I had hopes that maybe I, yeah, I had started to mend. Never was a hope more ill-founded. No one had told me that sometimes a bug that gets up inside there, whether it's warm, where it's warm and wet, can take a day or two off to rest before coming on strong again. I would have been surprised to know it. I would have been even more surprised to know that in another 15 or 20 years, there will be pills you could take that will smack that sort of infection out of your system in record time. And while those pills might make you feel a little sick at your stomach or loosen your bowels, they almost never made you vomit the way Dr. Sadler's sulfur pills did. Back in 32, there wasn't much you could do but wait and try to ignore that feeling that someone had spilled coal oil inside your works and then touched a match to it. I finished my butt, went into the bedroom, and finally got to sleep. I dreamed of girls with shy smiles and blood in their Chapter 6. The next morning, there's a pink memo slip on my desk asking me to stop by the warden's office as soon as I could. I knew what that was about. They were unwritten but very important rules to the game, and I had stopped playing, them, playing by them for a while yesterday. And so I put it off as long as possible. Like going to the doctor about my waterworks problem, I suppose. I've always thought this. Get it over with. Business was overrated. Anyway, I didn't hurry to Warden Moore's office. I stripped off my wool uniform coat instead, hung it over the back of my chair, and turned on the fan in the corner. It was another hot one. Then I sat down and went over Brutus Howell's night sheet. There was nothing there to get alarmed about. Delacoria wept briefly after turning in. He did most nights, and more for himself than for the folks he had roasted alive. I'm quite sure. And then had taken Mr. Jingles, the mouse, out of the cigar box he slept in. That it, that it calmed Dell, and he had slept like a baby the rest of the night. Mr. Jingles had most likely spent it on Delacroix's stomach, with his tail curled over his paws, eyes unblinking. It was as if God decided Delacroix needed a guardian angel, but had decreed in his wisdom that only a mouse would do for a rat like our homicidal friend from Louisiana. Not all, not all that was in Brutal's report, of course, but I had done enough night watches myself to fill in the stuff between the lines. There's a brief note about coffee. Late awake, mostly quiet, may have cried some. I tried to get some talk started, but after a few grunted replies from coffee, gave up. Paul or Harry may have better luck. Getting the talk started was at the center of our job, really. I didn't know it then, but holding back from the van but looking back from the vantage point of this strange old age, I think all old ages seem strange to the folk who most endure them. I understand that it was, and why I didn't see it then, it was too big as central to our work as our representation was to our lives, as our respiration was to our lives. It wasn't important that the floaters be good at getting the talk started but it was vital for me and Harry and Brutal and Dean. And it was one reason why Percy Wetmore was such a disaster. The inmates hated him. The guards hated him. Everyone hated him, presumably, except for his political connections. Percy himself, and maybe, but only maybe, his mother. He was like a close close of white arsenic sprinkled into a wedding cake. And I think I knew he spelled disaster from the start. He was an accident waiting to happen. As for the rest of us, he would have scoffed at the idea that we function most usefully not as the guards of the condemned, but as the psychiatrist. Part of me still wants to scoff at that idea today, but we knew about getting the talk started. And without the talk, men facing old Sparky had a nasty habit of going insane. I made a note at the bottom of Brutal's report to talk to John Coffey, to try at least, and then passed on to a note from Curtis Anderson, the warden's chief assistant. It said that he, Anderson expected a DOE order for Edward Delacour. Anderson's misspelling. Anderson's misspelling the man's name was actually Edward Del- Delacour. Very soon. DOE stood for date of ex- execution, and according to the note, Curtis had been told on good authority that the little Frenchman would take the walk shortly before Halloween. October 27th was his best guess. And Curtis Anderson's guesses were very were very informed. But before then, we could expect a new resident, name of William Wharton. He's what you like to call a problem child, Curtis had written in his back slanting and somehow prissy script. 
crazy wild and proud of it. Has rambled all over the state for the last year or so and has hit the big time at last. Killed three people in a holdup, one a pregnant woman. Killed a fourth in the getaway, state patrolman. All he missed was a nun and a blind man. I smiled a little at that. Wharton is 19 years old, has Billy the Kid tattooed on his upper, upper left forearm. You have to slap his nose a time or two, I guarantee you that. But be careful when you do it. This man just doesn't care. He had underlined this last sentence twice, then finished. Also, he may be a hangarounder. He's working appeals, and there's the fact that he is a minor. A crazy kid working appeals has to be around for a while. Oh, that sounded just fine. Suddenly, the day seemed hotter than ever, and I could no longer put off seeing Warden Morris. I worked for three wardens during my years as a cold mountain guard. Hal Moores was the last and best of them, and a walk. Honest, straightforward, lacking even Curtis Anderson's rudimentary, rudimentary wit, but equipped with just enough political savvy to keep his job during those grim years, and enough integrity to keep from getting seduced by the game. He would not rise any higher, but that seemed all right with him. He was 58 or 9 back then, with a deeply lined bloodhound face that Bobo Marchand probably would have felt right at home with. He had white hair and his hands shook with some sort of palsy, but he was strong. The year before, when a prisoner had rushed him in the exercise yard with a shank whittled out of a crate slat, Morris had stood his ground, grabbed the stake hound's wrist, and had twisted it so hard that the snapping bones had sounded like dry twigs burning in a hot fire. The skate hound, all his grievous, grievousness forgotten, had gone down his knees in the dirt and began screaming for his mother. I'm not her, Morris said in his culture southern voice, but if I was, I'd raise up my skirts and piss on you from the, from the loins that gave you birth. When I came into his office, he started to get up, and I, wanted, and I waved him back down. I took the seat across the desk from him and began by asking about his wife. He said, in our part of the world, that's not how you do it. How's that pretty gal of yours, is what I asked as if Melinda had seen only 17 summers instead of 62 or 3. My concern was genuine. She was a woman I could have loved and married myself if the lines of our lives had, had coincided. But I didn't mind diverting him a little from his main business either. He sighed deeply. Not so well, Paul. Not so well at all. More headaches? Only one this week, but it was the worst yet. Put her flat on her back for most of the day before yesterday. And now she's developed his weaknesses in her right hand. He raised his own liver spot at right hand. We both watched it tremble above his blotter for a moment or two, and then he lowered it again. I could tell he would have given just about anything not to be telling me what he was telling me. And we're out giving just about everything not to hear it. Melinda's headaches had started in the spring, and all that summer her doctor had been saying they were nervous tension in migraines, perhaps caused by the stress of Hal's coming retirement, except that neither of them could, could, neither of them could wait for his retirement. And my own wife had told me that migraine is not a disease of the old, but the young. By the time his sufferers reached Melinda Moore's age, they were usually getting better, not worse. And now this weakness of the hand, it didn't sound like nervous tension to me. It sounded like a damn stroke. Dr. Haverstrom wants her to the hospital up in Indianola, Moore said. Had some tests, head x-rays, he means. Who knows what else? She's scared to death, he paused and added. Truth to tell, so am I. Yeah, but you see, she does it, I said. Don't wait. If it turns out to be something they can see with an x-ray, it may turn out to be something they can fix. Yes, he agreed. And then, for just a moment, the only one during that part of our interview, as I recall, our eyes met and locked. There was a sort of nakedly perfect understanding between us that needs no words. It could be a stroke, yes. It could also be a cancer growing in her brain. And if it was that, the chances that the doctors at Indianola could do anything about it were slim going on none. This was 32, remember, when even something as relatively simple as a urinary infection was either sulfur and sink or suffering weak. I thank you for, I thank you for your concern, Paul. Now let's talk about Percy Wetmore. I groaned and covered my eyes. I had a call from the state capitol this morning, the warden said evenly. It was quite an angry call, and I'm sure you can imagine, Paul, the governor is, is the governor is so married, he's almost not there, if you take my meaning. And his wife has a brother who has one child. That child is Percy Wetmore. 
Percy called his dad last night, and Percy's dad called Percy's aunt. Do I have to do I have to trace the rest of this out for you? No, I said. Percy squealed, just like the schoolroom sissy telling teacher he saw Jack and Jill smooching in the cloakroom. Yep, Moore's agreed. That's about the size of it. You know what happened between Percy and Delacroy when Delacroy came in, I asked? Percy and his damn Hickory Billy Club? Yeah, but and you know he runs it along the bar sometimes, just for the pure hell of it. He's mean and he's stupid, and I don't know how much longer I can take him. That's the truth. We'd known each other five years. That can be a long time for men who get on well, especially when part of the job is trading life for death. What I'm saying is that he understood what I meant. Not that I would quit, not with the depression walking around outside the prison walls like a dangerous criminal, one that couldn't be caged as our charges were. Better men than me were out on the roads or riding the rods. I was lucky and knew it. Children grown and the mortgage, that 200 pound block of marble, have been off my chest for the last two years. But a man's gotta eat, and his wife has to eat too. Also, we were used to sending our daughter and son-in-law 20 bucks whenever we could afford it. And sometimes when we couldn't, if James' letters sounded particularly desperate. He was an out of works high school teacher. And if that didn't qualify for desperate back in those days, then the word had no meaning. So no, you didn't walk off a steady paycheck job like mine. Not in cold blood, that was. But my blood wasn't cold that fall. The temperatures outside were unseasonable, and the affection crawling around inside of me had turned the thermostat up even more. And when a man's in that kind of situation, why sometimes his fish flies out pretty much of his own accord. And if you slung a connected man like Percy Wetmore once, you might as well just go right on slugging, because there's no going back. Stick with it, Moore said quietly. That's what I called you in here to say. I have it on good authority. The person who called me this morning, in fact, that Percy has an application in at Briar, and that his application will be accepted. Briar, I said. That was Briar Ridge, one of two state-run hospitals. What's this kid doing? Touring state facilities? It's an administration job. Better pay and papers to push instead of hospital beds in the heat of the day. He gave me a slanted grin. You know, Paul, you might be shed of him already if he hadn't put him in the switch room with Van Hay when the chair when the chief walked. For a moment, what he said seemed so peculiar, I didn't have a clue. What was he getting at? Maybe I didn't want to have a clue. Where else would I put him, I asked? Christ, he already knows what he's doing on the block. To make him part of the active execution team? I didn't finish. Couldn't finish. The potential for screw-ups seemed endless. Nevertheless, you do well to put him out for Delacour, if you want to get rid of him, that is. I looked at him with my jaw hung. At last... I was able to get up where it belonged so I could talk. What are you saying? That he wants to experience one right up close where he can smell the guy's guts cooking? Moore shrugged, his eyes so soft when he had been speaking about his wife now looked flinty. Delacroix's nuts are going to cook whether Wetmore is on the team or not, he said. Correct? Yes, but he could screw up. In fact, how? He's almost bound to screw up. And in front of 30 or so witnesses, reporters all the way up from Louisiana, you and Brutus Howell will make sure he doesn't, Moore said. And if he does anyway, it goes on his record, and he'll still be there long after his statehouse connections are gone. You understand? I did. It made me feel sick and scared, but I did. He may want to stay for coffee, but if you're lucky, he'll get all he needs from Delacour. You just make sure you put him out for that one. I had planned to stick Percy in the switch room again, then down in the tunnel riding shotgun on the gurney, that would take Delacroix to the meat wagon parked across the road from the prison. But I tossed all those plans back over my shoulder without so much as a second look. I nodded. I had the sense to know it was a gamble I was taking, but I didn't care. If it would get rid of Percy Wetmore, I'd tweak the devil's nose. He could take part in his execution, clamp on the cap, and then look through the grill and tell Van, o Van Hay to, to roll on too. He could watch the little freshman ride lightning that key. Percy Wetmore had let it out of the bottle. Let him have his nasty little thrill, if that's what state sanctioned murder, state sanctioned murder was to him. Let him go on to Briar Ridge, where he could have his own office and a fan to cool it. And if his uncle by marriage was voted out of office in the next election, he had to find out what work was like in the tough old some big world where not all the bad guys were locked behind bars, and sometimes you got your own head whipped, 
so much the better. All right, I said, standing up. I'll put him out front for Delacour, and in the meantime, I'll keep the peace. Good, he said, and stood up himself. By the way, how's that problem of yours? He pointed delicately in the direction of my groin. Seems a little better. Well, that's fine. He saw me to the door. What about coffee, by the way? Is he going to be a problem? I don't think so, I said. So far, he's been quiet as a dead rooster. He's strange. Strange eyes, but quiet. We'll keep tabs on him, though. Don't worry about that. You know what he did, of course. Sure. He was seeing me through to the outer office by then, when old Miss Hannah sat bashing away at her underwood, as she had ever since the last ice age had ended, it seemed. I was happy to go. All in all, I felt as if I'd gotten off easy. And it was nice to know there was a chance of surviving Percy after all. You simmer in the whole basket of my love, I said. And don't go buying you an extra crate of trouble either. It'll probably turn out to be nothing but migraine after all. You bet, he said. And below his sick eyes, his lips smiled. The combination was damn near ghoulish. As for me, I went back to E-Block to start another day. There was paperwork to be read and written. There were floors to be mopped. There were meals to be served. A duty roster to be made out for the following week. There were a hundred details to be seen to, but mostly there was waiting. In prison, there's always plenty of that. So much that never gets done. Waiting for Edward Delacour to walk the Green Mile. Waiting for William Wharton to arrive with his curled lip and Billy the Kid tattoo. And most of all, waiting for Percy Wetmore to be gone out of my life. End of chapter six. So at this time, you need to take a look at the quiz attached to the assignment. Hopefully you've been taking notes during the reading so that it makes it easier for you to answer the questions. Complete this quiz and submit it when you are done.